The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to this learning session. My name is Ivo Bantambia, your physics teacher. Today's lesson is for the 4-5 class. Before we get to the lesson proper, we are going to do a correction of the assignment we got in the previous lesson. The question was, what is the effect of temperature on the conductivity of semiconductors? I hope you had the right answer. An increase in temperature of a semiconductor leads to an increase in its conductivity. This is because more charge carriers, that is electron hole pairs, are thermally generated. As we saw in our previous lesson, a semiconductor at a low temperature does not have electrons in the conduction band. But at a higher temperature, electrons gain energy, sufficient energy, and break free from their atoms and move to the higher energy level, that is the conduction band, where they will be able to take part in conduction. Therefore, for a semiconductor, the higher the temperature, the more the electrons will gain energy and move to the conduction band. And when we have more electrons in the conduction band, uh, the conductivity of the material will increase. Our lesson for today will be on semiconductors or types of semiconductors. The lesson shall unfold as follows. We are going to have learning outcomes, prerequisites, puzzling questions, learning activities, and we will end up with an assignment. By the end of this lesson, learners are expected to be able to distinguish between intrinsic and extrinsic semiconductors. Learners should be able to define doping, Learners should be able to distinguish between the types of semiconductors, that is, between N-type semiconductors and uh, P-type semiconductors. To understand this lesson properly, we are going to make use of the knowledge learned previously on the conduction in pure semiconductors. Let's remind ourselves with the answers to these questions. How are holes formed in pure semiconductors? The expected response is, holes are produced when electrons that have acquired sufficient energy jump from the valence band to the conduction band, leaving behind vacancies in atoms which are positively charged. This question we should ask ourselves, why do some materials like pure semiconductors conduct electricity at higher temperatures and they do not conduct at low temperatures? All right, 
Semiconductors can be classified as intrinsic semiconductors and uh, extrinsic semiconductors, depending on the purity of the material of the semiconductor, depending on the presence or, at, uh, or absence of atoms of another element in the semiconductor material. Let us look at intrinsic semiconductors. Intrinsic semiconductors are called pure semiconductors. These are semiconductors that do not contain foreign atoms, that is, atoms of a different material in the semiconductor. We have only the atoms of the semiconductor material itself. For example, a piece of silicon or germanium that contains only the atoms of silicon or a material that contains only the atoms of germanium. That is an intrinsic semiconductor. The figure illustrates the crystal structure of an intrinsic semiconductor. We have seen in our previous lesson that semiconductors are group four elements. Germanium and silicon are group four elements. They have four valence electrons. The atoms have four valence electrons. So in the crystal lattice, each atom has four neighbors. And the outermost electrons of each atom are involved in covalent bonding. This, uh, each of the atoms shares its uh, outermost electron or one electron with one neighbor to form a covalent bond. As you can see here, these are five silicon atoms and around each of the atoms there are four valence electrons. These are the valence electrons shown on the diagram. Now, each of the electrons, each of the four electrons is shared with a neighboring atom to form a covalent bond. So all the electrons are involved in covalent bonds with the neighbor, with the neighbors, with the silicon atoms. So they form silicon-silicon bonds with these outermost electrons. These bonds are complete because you see there, when they share the electrons, you know from your basic knowledge of chemistry that an atom will be stable with eight electrons in its outermost shell. By virtue of sharing these electrons, each atom here ends up having eight electrons that spin around the nucleus of that atom. So this is how a pure intrinsic or an intrinsic semiconductor looks like in its crystal lattice. This is an extended diagram for a piece of semiconductor material, the crystal structure. Each atom having four electrons, the atomos share, and you see how each atom is, is involved in covalent bonds with four of its neighbors, with four neighbors. So here, we don't have three electrons. All the electrons are involved in bonding. That is why, as we saw in the band theory, the conduction band is empty. There are no electrons at a low temperature. There are no electrons in the conduction band. Atoms, as you have seen in the diagram, atoms of silicon and uh, germanium are tetravalent. So all these electrons are involved in bonding, as I've explained. And each covalent bond has a pair of electrons. Every atom shares one electron with each of its neighbors. 
Now, at very low temperatures, that is at zero Kelvin, the valence electrons are firmly bounded to the nucleus. So they are not free. The electrons are not free to move about the crystal lattice. The material will behave like an insulator or it will behave as an insulator. But at a higher temperature, some of the electrons will gain energy and break free from these bonds, from these covalent bonds, and move about the crystal structure, taking part in conduction. So you can see here, in this crystal lattice at a higher temperature, an electron will break free from the bond and will be able to move about the crystal lattice. These are some of the electrons that have broken free from the bonds and are now able to move about the crystal lattice. So the electron becomes free, free in the sense that it is not involved in bonding, but it remains attracted by the nuclei of the atoms. So very less energy is needed to move these electrons from one part to another. Whereas those electrons that are involved in bonding, which are uh, uh, tightly bound to the atom, they are not free to move. When an electron leaves the bond, it leaves behind a vacancy, which can be filled by an electron from a neighboring atom. That is why at a higher temperature in an intrinsic semiconductor, we are going to have both uh, free electrons, free in the sense that they can move about the crystal lattice, and we can have holes. This vacancy can be filled by an electron from a neighboring atom. And when that happens, a hole is created. A hole has the same charge as an electron, but opposite. So in a pure semiconductor, once an electron breaks free, it creates a hole. That is, in a pure semiconductor, there are equal number of free electrons as there are holes. So the semiconductor remains neutral. All right. The direction of movement of these electrons, when they break free from the bonds, from uh, the atoms, when they break free and move about the crystal lattice, electrons from neighboring atoms can come in to fill the vacancy. So you see that as electrons move in one direction, the holes will move in the opposite direction. In a semiconductor, holes and electrons move in different directions in the process of conduction. For extrinsic semiconductors, what is an extrinsic semiconductor? Now, we will talk about a semiconductor which is no longer pure. If you take a pure semiconductor, and add some foreign atoms to it. You add some foreign atoms, that is, atoms of a different element to it, it will become impure. These impure semiconductors are called extrinsic semiconductors. The process of adding foreign atoms to a pure semiconductor so that it becomes an extrinsic semiconductor is called doping. So a pure semiconductor is doped by some little quantities of foreign atoms called impurity atoms or dopants to a pure semiconductor so that it becomes an extrinsic semiconductor. When doping takes place, the conductivity of the semiconductor improves. The conductivity improves. We are going to look at the crystal lattice. We'll see that when doping takes place, more charge carriers are then available for the material to conduct.
Extrinsic semiconductors can be classified into two subgroups. That is, as we can have n-type and uh, p-type, depending on the type of impurity atoms that are added to produce this extrinsic semiconductor. The type of impurity atoms we use are either trivalent or pentavalent. That is, we can use group 3 elements to dump a pure semiconductor to obtain an extrinsic semiconductor, as well as we can use pentavalent atoms, that is, elements of group 5 of the periodic table. In each case, we are going to end up with a different type of an extrinsic semiconductor. So we can either have an N-type semiconductor or a P-type semiconductor. When do we have an N-type? When do we end up with a P-type semiconductor? Now, an N-type semiconductor is obtained when we use pentavalent atoms to dump a, semi, a pure semiconductor with. We use group 5 atoms or elements to dump, to add to a pure semiconductor. On, on your screen, you have a figure. Here we have the crystal lattice of an n-type semiconductor. In this case, phosphorus, which is a pentavalent atom, is used to dump the semiconductor material. Little quantities of phosphorus are added. Here, this is a site that was initially occupied by a silicon atom. But now, it is being occupied by a phosphorus atom. And phosphorus has five electrons in its outermost shell. These are the five electrons. Out of these five electrons, four of them will take part in bonding, just as we saw, just like we saw with an intrinsic semiconductor. It will, the four of the five electrons will take part in bonding with the four neighboring atoms. And one electron will not be involved in bonding. Since this one electron is not involved in bonding, it is relatively free compared to the four others which are involved in bonding. So, this free electron, free in the sense that it is not, uh, it requires just less energy to cause it to move, this free electron will therefore be available for the material to conduct electricity. Therefore, adding pentavalent atoms to an intrinsic semiconductor will help to improve on its conductivity because the impurity atom provides an extra electron that can take part in conduction. All right, so as we have seen, in an n-type semiconductor, we make use of pentavalent impurity atoms, which will provide an extra electron that will take part in bonding. The movement of these free electrons will, will constitute the flow of current in the semiconductor. Now, we should also take note that the conduction in an n-type does not only depend on these free electrons provided by the impurity atoms. No, at higher temperatures, electron hole pairs are equally thermally generated to add to the electrons that are provided by the impurity atoms. So, higher, at higher temperatures, more electrons are generated, which will lead to a higher uh, uh, conductivity of the semiconductor or will lead to a decrease in the resistance of the semiconductor. Take note, 
The pentavalent impurity is called donor. It is called a donor impurity because, as we saw in that figure, when it is introduced in the semiconductor, only four electrons will take part in bonding with the neighboring atoms, and one electron will remain free for conduction. So this impurity atom has donated a conduction electron to the crystal lattice. That is why they are called donor impurities. Now, in this type of semiconductors, we have mostly the negatively charged uh, carriers, that is electrons, that take part in conduction. Because charged carriers that are thermally generated are equal in number. That is holes and electrons that are thermally generated, they are equal in number. But we have extra electrons provided by the impurity atoms. So on overall, we have more negative charge carriers than positive charge carriers. Hence the name N-type. Therefore, in an N-type semiconductor, we have more conduction electrons than holes. Electrons are in the majority and the holes are in the minority. So electrons are majority, we, are, we describe them as majority charge carriers, while holes are minority charge carriers in N-type semiconductors. Let us equally take note that when impurity atoms are added, even though pentavalent, which provides more electrons to the material, the overall material remains electrically neutral. Even though it has more conduction electrons, the material remains electrically neutral because the number of negatively charged electrons is equal to the number of positively charged protons in the whole uh, piece of material. We are not comparing, we are not comparing the number of conduction electrons to holes. No. The number of negatively charged electrons in the whole material is equal to the number of positively charged uh, protons that are found in that piece of material. So it remains electrically neutral. Now we move over to the P-type semiconductor. Unlike the N-type semiconductor, we can obtain a P-type semiconductor when an intrinsic semiconductor is docked with a trivalent impurity. As you can see in the figure, uh, we have silicon atoms there with the four electrons in the outermost shell. Now, introducing small amounts of aluminum which have aluminum atom, which an aluminum atom there, which has only three electrons in the outer motion. So you see that there is a deficiency because normally the, the atoms in the crystal lattice, which have four electrons in the outer motion, will be able to have uh, four covalent bonds with the neighbors. But in this case, when a trivalent impurity comes in, with only three electrons in the outermost shell, there will be a deficiency because we will have only three complete covalent bonds around the impurity, at the impurity atom, around the aluminum. We have only three complete covalent bonds. The other one, there is a vacancy. There is a deficiency in an electron. So, this bonding here is not complete. It will only be completed when it will be complete when an electron from a neighboring bond comes in to fill this vacancy. And when an electron moves from a neighboring bond to fill this vacancy, it will create a hole in that area where it lives. Therefore, 
in a P-type semiconductor, holes will be generated by the movement of electrons from the bonds to fill the vacancies created by the impurity atoms. Consequently, in a P-type semiconductor, we are going to have more holes. There will be more holes than, of course, the impurity atom provides holes, which will take part in conduction. Now, due, uh, at higher temperatures, electron hole pairs will be thermally generated to add to the holes provided by the impurity atoms. So we can see that for a P-type semiconductor, there will be more holes than electrons. There will be more holes than conduction electrons. So, uh, to obtain, we are taking note, to obtain P-type semiconductors, we use trivalent impurity atoms. The three, the three electrons, the three electrons in the outermost shell of the impurity atom takes part in bonding, creating a vacancy which can be filled by electrons from neighboring bonds. And when these electrons from neighboring bonds move to fill the vacancies, holes are created. Also take note that just like in N-type semiconductors, here in the P-type conductor, semiconductor, holes and electrons move in opposite directions. Now, trivalent impurity atoms are described as acceptor impurities. Why are they called acceptor impurities? They are acceptor impurities because they create vacancies that can receive electrons from neighboring bonds. We should also take note that in a P-type semiconductor, mostly the positively charged carriers are involved in bonding. Hence the name P-type. The holes are positively charged. So the holes are the majority charged carriers in P-types, while electrons are the minority charge carriers. We should equally take note that the addition of these trivalent impurity atoms leave the semiconductor electrically neutral because the number of negative charges in the whole piece of material equal to the number of protons. The number of electrons equal to the number of protons. What are the key differences between intrinsic and extrinsic semiconductors? One, intrinsic semiconductors are said to be pure because they don't contain foreign atoms, while extrinsic semiconductors are impure because they contain atoms of different elements dubbed in them. The second difference Due to the pure form of intrinsic semiconductors, the, uh, the conductivity of an intrinsic semiconductor is relatively lower than that of an extrinsic semiconductor. Remember, doping is a process that improves the conductivity of a semiconductor. So extrinsic sem semiconductors have a higher conductivity compared to intrinsic semiconductors. Third, there is an almost equivalent concentration of electron hole pairs in intrinsic semiconductors. The number of holes is equal to the number of conduction electrons in semiconductors, in intrinsic semiconductors. Whereas in extrinsic semiconductors, the number of holes and the conduction electrons are unequal. In a P-type, there will be more holes than electrons. 
than conduction electrons. In an n-type, there will be more conduction electrons than holes. Now, the conductivity of an intrinsic semiconductor relies on the temperature alone. It relies on the temperature alone because the charge carriers are thermally generated. On the contrary, in an extrinsic semiconductor, the conductivity relies on both temperature and the, the concentration of impurity atoms. The more the impurity atoms in the semiconductor, the greater the conductivity. Lastly, intrinsic semiconductors, we cannot classify intrinsic semiconductors into any further classes. Whereas for extrinsic semiconductors, we can subdivide them into intrinsic and into n-type and uh, p-type. These are the basic differences between intrinsic and uh, extrinsic semi. Uh, yeah, between intrinsic and uh, extrinsic semiconductors. Silicon and germanium are examples of intrinsic semiconductors, whereas doping arsenide or phosphorus like uh, phosphor phosphorus like elements in pure semiconductors form extrinsic semiconductors. So you take note here, it is similar to the first one. Uh, intrinsic semiconductors are pure. They don't contain any foreign atoms. We can obtain, we can have intrinsic semiconductors naturally, but extrinsic semiconductors are produced by the process of doping. We are going to look at some exercises very quickly. What define doping? Two, give two examples each of donor dopant. B, acceptor dopant. Three, state which type of impurity atoms are used to produce A, an N-type semiconductor. B, a P-type semiconductor. The expected responses are, for question one, doping is the process of addition of small amounts of impurity atoms, called dopants, to a pure semiconductor material in order to improve on its electrical conductivity. Question two, give two examples each of A, dopant donor or donor dopant, B, acceptor dopant. For A, a donor dopant will be a pentavalent atom, like arsenic and uh, antimony. These are pentavalent atoms. And uh, for acceptor dopants, we'll have trivalent atoms, such as Gallium and uh, indium. Question three: State which type of impurity atoms are used to produce A, an n-type, B, p-type. It is obvious here: pentavalent impurities will produce an n-type semiconductor, while uh, trivalent impurities will be used to dump an intrinsic material an intrinsic semiconductor to obtain a P-type semiconductor. So coming back to our po uh, puzzling question, explain why some materials like pure semiconductors conduct electricity at higher temperatures and do, do not at low temperatures. The obvious answer will be at low temperatures, pure semiconductors do not have charge or free charge carriers. At higher temperatures, the charge carriers responsible for conduction are thermally generated. Your assignment for this lesson today is classify semiconductors. Question two. In a tabular form, 
state the differences between intrinsic and extrinsic semiconductors. Our lesson was drawn from ordinary level physics in modern approach by Paco Ivo and from standard ordinary level physics by Tam Philly. Our next lesson will be on the PN junction. Tam tam a tonge tam zabike tam 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 a mote tam zabike mane tam bia ninya ne injo bia yen 